Hey everybody, really excited today to unpack how AI powered transcription is reshaping everything from journalism to media and the future of content creation. Lasse, how are you? I am good. Thank you so much. How Thanks are you? for being here. I'm well. Thanks so much. Uh, from Denmark, one of my favorite destinations. But let's start from the beginning. What's the origin story behind Good Tape? Uh, what problem were you trying to solve uh, back in the day? Um, yeah, so Good Tape has a bit of an untraditional sto- backstory. Uh, we're originally a, uh, what's called a spin out. Uh, so we were spun out of a media company uh, mm. called Sidman, which is also why we sort of almost had what I would say call in- instant product market fit uh, because we built something for the people that sat basically next to us uh, for the journalists. They were just basically screaming at every lunch saying, listen, I'm spending four hours every day just being a robot, transcribing, turning audio into text. It sucks. And whenever someone says something like that, it's like, okay, the, there's an issue here um, that we then made a pretty bare bone solution to like a, an internal folder where you could drag and drop. And then everyone went crazy and said it was like magic. Uh, and then it sort of just spread very uh, organically when we we made like a live version um, that people could just use for free. And then we got, I think it was like 18,000 users, just word of mouth in, in a month and a half. Wow. Uh, and really saw, okay, something something's here. Um, and then we went a little bit deeper and made a little bit nicer, made the UI a little bit more friendly rather than just like a very bare bone uh, piece of, of software. Uh, and then instant product market fit and have just been growing ever since. And today we have about two and a half million users. Uh, wow. um, yeah, so doing well. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And when you look at the media landscape today, and I consider myself a little media company, uh, almost yeah. <laughs> uh, like a two man band, but the big picture, how is AI changing the way that journalists and podcasters and creators like myself are working big picture wise? Mm. I think I think if you had asked me two years ago, I would have said something different. Um, because back then it was very much a how can AI eliminate manual work or boring mm. manual work and, and and do something for you as a journalist. And now it's more of how much can AI do or can we add another layer? It's already at that stage. Um, but I think there's still a lot of it depends on what market you're looking at. If, if I'm looking at Denmark, AI adoption is just really high. Everyone mm-hmm. sort of says, "Oh, I'll just chat GPT this or or whatever." But if we're if we're looking at at other markets like Indonesia or the Philippines uh, or Taiwan, um, there's just not a option. So, just a speech to text being automated by AI seems like magic still. <laughs> um, and it's just sometimes remembering that AI is everywhere in some countries, but mm-hmm. in the, in, not in all countries. Um, so just really keeping that that thought in the back of our minds when we develop things. Um, yeah, that we're not necessarily competing with ChatGPT everywhere, mm. uh, just some places. Well said. And Good Tape is known for not training its models on user data. That's very yeah. European of you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well done. Why was that such a core value right from the beginning? Because it's the first question everyone asks. Um, and if you say you train on data, they just click the red button and say they don't even say goodbye. Uh, so it's been <laughs> like if a, it's it's our it's our access ticket to just get in the door is to say we don't touch your data. Um, I think there's a big thing at the moment, and I think we're going to be a bit clearer about it in the in the coming months of how many of our competitors train on data without telling you. Mm. Uh, it's a bit of a it's a topic very, very top of mind for me. Um, that it, yeah, it, it's a bit. I call it like it's modern pickpocketing um, to just take a little bit of data without you knowing it. But it's cheap and it's fast. But <laughs> you're paying with something else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really well said. So there's a lot of layers to to that confidentiality. You know, mm-hmm. is make or break in many industries, professions, journalism, yeah. but also in the enterprise corporate world. Yeah. So how do how do you ensure that sensitive content actually stays protected? So we've from the beginning, everything we we do is built in house. So we don't have just like an API or an endpoint somewhere like like a lot of of the 
like the, the, the ones popping up do. Uh, so everything is built and hosted in-house and everything. I'm, I'm not afraid to say that we don't have as many features as, as some of our competitors do, uh, but it's because we've allocated all of our resources to go and build the core part of it really well and really securely and not just, oh, now you can do summary and then oh actually that's because it's an integration to chat gpt and then you upload your entire transcription and um, so everything is very securely and then will be will be iso certified hopefully before the end of the year uh, which is the worst thing i've ever done in my life uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's just really saying like compliancy and and doing things being the nice guys is a pretty big selling point when everyone a lot of the other guys are not being very nice um yeah, so yeah, really, yeah, to say the least. Awesome. And what, yeah. what do you think most people misunderstand, users? What do they misunderstand about things like ethics, accuracy, oversight you mentioned when it comes to transcription? We just look at it, it's magical, it works. Mm -hmm. And we don't think, or many of us don't think more about it, but what are we not thinking about? <laughs> and a misconception that I really saw a lot in the beginning, but I'm also seeing it less and less, is, is that there's just this broad term of AI. So mm. we heard a lot, especially in the beginning, where users would say, no, I'm actually not allowed to use ChatGPT in my work. And we're like, we're not ChatGPT just because we're AI. So there's a lot of, there's degrees of information uh, to understand the, like, just for example, the that a lot of the enterprise houses have something where they say, you can't use any generative AI. And then we're not generative, but the users don't really have that level of understanding the differences. Mm. Um, so, so having to get past that barrier of understanding that also requires that they trust you when you say, no, we're not that, that they don't just think you're trying to sell them something. Um, so really the knowledge part of AI, which will be, it's improving as we speak. Uh, it's way different now than it was two years ago, but I still, I still hear it quite often. Fantastic. And you have, I think you said almost 3 million users. Um, what do you think earn that level of trust so quickly beyond being nice guys from a nice country? Uh, what, what else? <laughs> I, I think it is our approach to things. And it's a very, mm. we, we, from the beginning decided that there's a cost to all features of simplicity. Like if you, if you check out our, our platform, it's so simple. Like it's very neat and, and it feels very approachable and, and risk-free to just start using it. Um, and then also just because it's such a clear need, like, I don't want to spend four hours doing this if something can do it for me in one minute and it's $10 and uh, it's, it's a pretty easy sell. Um, so it just spreads like wildfire if you're actually solving a problem. Well said. Yeah, very good. And when you look at your competitors, and we won't get into specifics, but are there particular innovations or features, functionality, you think, that really set you apart, that you're proud of? There will be. Um, yeah. There is, of course, now. I think I'm really proud of us hosting everything ourselves and the accuracy of the, mm. of the core mm. value we serve. But the roadmap is really taking us down something where we. I just came out of a meeting now where it's it's almost scary the level of user feedback that we have to get to to really nail it because it's like a it's a thing that that it's not comparable to anything um it's sort of like we're without going too much into it but we're going to try and 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 make like an artificial memory that will remind you of things that you might have forgotten in some of your previous work um which is very difficult because you're trying to emulate memory and my memory is very different from your memory of maybe you're reminded once every 10 seconds of something and maybe i'm tired and only want to be reminded once every hour and um, so yeah it's a it's a very very interesting um direction to take which will sure. be much more than just transcription and, and multilingual transcription is exploding you know a lot about that in europe but beyond that, I mean, global use cases, so many diverse industry needs for multilingual transcription uh, in the U.S. It's in contact centers and call centers. And, yeah. you know, we have a lot of different languages here as well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about that opportunity? It makes my job both more difficult, but also more fun um, because it really becomes a job of saying no to a lot of things. 
Um, <laughs> if there's a large uh, telecom enterprise potential client that says, we'll convert if you build this feature. But then if we decided, no, we're going to be for journalists, that will not be relevant at all. Then there's a cost mm. again to implementing something. So it being such a generic technology that can that can sort of solve a very homogenous problem across a lot of verticals is sort of a, a challenge in terms of really sticking to your strategy and, and really saying we're going to be something for these people. Um, because you can be something for a lot of people, but you just have to decide who you want to be something for. Um, which is a yeah. it's on my table. <laughs> Lots of trade-offs for sure. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a peek into your tech stack, sort of behind the scenes? How do you, uh, does it work? Uh, maybe it, which LLMs do you use and uh, what kind of infrastructure do you need for transcription on such a scale? Yeah, yeah, I can give a bit of a sneak peek. Um, so we are running open source models, uh, primarily Whisper V3 Large. And then what we've focused on is just optimizing everything that's around the model. Um, because we saw, we actually saw a larger yield than that rather than investing resources into trying to fine tune something. So a lot of companies pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into mm. fine tuning ESR models. Um, but we've built, we, we, we usually say it in house, like we focused on building the PlayStation and then we're ready to switch out the PlayStation game and <laughs> being the model and really sort of relying on the open source community. And then at some point, of course, we'll give back. Um, but we've really come far from, from optimizing everything that's around the model. Um, and then we host, uh, I think it's Llama V3 or something at the moment, mm -hmm. um, to really also host everything ourselves. To mm. host a large language model is quite an undertaking when you're not that big of a company. Um, mm. I think a lot of SaaS entrepreneurs or founders underestimate the cost of AI when you then say I'm a SaaS founder, they say, oh, oh fucking your gross margin must be 99%. But but AI does actually have a, a cost, um, which was a little bit of a surprise uh, <laughs> when we came to to hosting a last language model ourselves. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure the economics are fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so zooming out, where do you see the this whole industry headed over the next couple of years? Transcription, that is. Uh, what are some of the big picture trends you're looking at and maybe just a sneak peek into your future like what, what ideas are you noodling on that you can share yeah um i think there's going to be a big difference in who you're building for uh, i see a lot of people building for the everyday user um you have a lot of meeting integration agents that'll just transcribe and summarize everything um where then we've really nailed down who we're, we're something for and we're something for the people that record something to use it. And um, mm. so I'm interviewing someone to use it. You're, we're talking here because I, what I'm saying now will be part of the output. It's part of what value I'm trying crea to create, which is very different to, oh, I just want a summary of my meeting because I maybe want to remember it at some point. And um, so there's, from my point of view, there's two very clear distinctions of what is it, a, what is the need that you're building to solve for? Um, and then I think structurally, I think we're going to see a lot of roll-ups. I think there's going to be a mm. lot of money and um, there's so many popping up everywhere. So I think at some point it'll just be a part, uh, uh, it'll just be who raises the most money and goes out and buys <laughs> the rest, um, which is going to be interesting to see. And I think it's going to be soon. I think it's going to be within two, three years. Yeah, fascinating. Um, there are lots of entrepreneurs like yourself diving into this marketplace now with amazing apps and services. And um, it's sort of the Wild West uh, out here in the US and ar around the world. Any advice for founders and entrepreneurs who would love almost 3 million users like like mm -hmm. yourself? How any what, what advice would you, would you give them if they're just kind of starting out now? I think uh, a mistake that we're also making often, uh, but we're catching ourselves in making it, is that with AI, you can build so many cool things, but just because you can build it doesn't mean that there's a need for it. Um, so we're getting caught up often and getting very excited about all the things we can do. And to the extent that sometimes we're forgetting of why would we do it? 
Um, and I see a lot of AI startups pop up where it's like, wow, okay, you can do that. Why? Um, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> and I can see that the technology is incredible and it'll be even more incredible in a year. But but why? Who would who would buy it and mm. solving? Um, so just the the idea of technology, the pace of technology has sort of overtaken the pace of problems, if that makes sense. That it's just there's so many things it can do, but it doesn't mean that there are equally more problems to solve, um, which is a trap I see a lot of people fall into. Uh, so yeah, that's a lot of mine fields out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm heading into CES in the next few weeks, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the big consumer powwow. And so far, I've seen at least four or five pitches for transcription devices, you know, yeah. wearables and tablets and uh, pins and accessories, all, all kinds of things. I mean, do you think there's a future beyond transcription in just using our phones and, and laptops? Are you looking at devices or is this just kind of a... Uh, you know, a diversion from them. I think it's interesting because I've, I've sort of allowed myself to believe in the future that every meeting in all companies will be transcribed at some point. Mm. Um, if I were to do a Black Mirror episode, it would be that <laughs> all, all tables in all meeting rooms had a microphone in the middle. Um, for now, we've built, the re we've built a recorder app because everyone has a phone anyway. Mm. No, no need to develop a new piece of hardware that I then have to drag right. around. So it's just like for us, it's just I, I hold down the the power action button on my phone and then mm. it starts recording and transcribes. And I just put it on the middle of the table when I have a meeting. Very easy. So I don't see a need to develop hardware. Everyone has the hardware needed anyway. Um, so just build an app and then, of course, do meeting integrations and all of that. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it sounds like that's that's for sure. Although Facebook just bought a a wearable device. So who knows what they'll do with that for transcription. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, moving forward, what are you you know excited about as we, we head into the new year? Any, any travel, any, any plans, any news on the horizon we should uh, listen out for? Um, I would say the product announcement, I hope it's going to be Q1, probably end of Q1, where we'll, we'll do a beta of what we call artificial memory. For now, mm -hmm. it's name work in progress. Um, we'll do that hopefully end of q1 which will be everyone gets goosebumps when we talk about it in-house at least um so wow. I'm really well, getting really getting goosebumps now just the name i hope you trademark that because that sounds <laughs> amazing i'll go use one of those it. whatever it is i need in artificial memory so yeah right <laughs> <laughs> okay we have the All we right. have this internally where there's at least one colleague who's like i'm gonna record everything my wife said <laughs> <laughs> okay and vice versa let's 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 be uh equal opportunity offenders yeah. you know wives can record every everything the husband says oh, yeah, as well yeah, of course you're, you're very egalitarian in denmark i know yeah. <laughs> But thanks so much for joining. Really fun, interesting conversation. Thanks, Seems man. like it's still early days. So much more opportunity for you and this industry. Yeah, definitely. And I want to keep hold of that feeling that it's new early days. Thanks so much. And thanks, everyone, for listening and, and watching this episode. Also, check out our tech uh, impact.tv show now on Bloomberg and Fox Business. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lasse. Thank you.